yes it has started already yes yes we we have started i'm hoping you are not having too much youtube issues but uh yeah welcome uh, good morning good day uh, good evening from wherever you are uh, my name is ernst Baert from the hockeysite.com and i will be co-hosting today's live stream with my good friend from canada let me point in the right direction this nope that no. that, that that direction <laughs> No, that uh, come on. She's next to me, Keely Dunn from Canada, the the world's famous umpire whisperer from FH Umpire. So, uh, Keely, uh, always a pleasure to be on the show with you. Uh, but yeah, to avoid us having uh, all these online fights, um, we invited uh, two guests here, and and. Uh, uh, the ones who already uh, were expecting to see Xavier Reckinger there. No, he has not shaven his hair. Uh, this is actually Bernardo Fernandes, <laughs> the, the creator from South Pass and a coach in Germany at the moment. Uh, we had a what really was a last minute cancellation from Xavier Reckingham, but for a good reason. His uh, little boy got sick, so we had to take him to the doctor. And we are very happy that Bernardo was able to join us last minute to fill the coaching spot. And uh, we are very happy as well to have David Ames uh, among us. David Ames, uh, current international player for GB and England and whatever countries you all have at, at that island of you. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that you're still uh, uh, captaining uh, GB. Let, let, let's call it like that. And, uh, well, we're going to talk today about aerials. And uh, yeah, Keely thought if I'm going to talk as an umpire with a coach and a player about aerials, yeah, then then I need somebody there to to calm to calm everybody down and, and, to, and to to keep everybody grounded. So that that that's my role today. But I'm going to shut up as much as possible. And uh, Keely, it's all your shows now. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, this is, this is amazing. Anyway, Bernardo, thank you so much for stepping in. It's just so great. And I think the last time we had on a fight on Twitter, I don't even remember what it was about. So I'm amazed that you actually agreed to come back on, <laughs> but clearly you forgot what it was about too. So, so this is great. But anyway, thank you for stepping in so much and uh, really nice to have uh, David Ames along as well. I feel like I'm collecting Y1 players on the show. So <laughs> next up, I need you, Damal, to, to come on and make me laugh for a couple hours. So, so let's... You do want you. <laughs> I do. No, I do. I do. <laughs> very funny. Uh, very difficult guy. Very, very difficult guy, that guy. <laughs> Absolutely. So I don't have a strict, like, I don't have a lecture. I have none of that stuff because nobody likes to listen to umpires talk about rules. I do have them on the exactly. side if we need to go and refer to them because sometimes there's mysterious things that pop up, like different words that you didn't know were actually included in them. So they're available, but... Um, what we did was we put together a number of clips that we can talk through together because I think that's a really useful way of, I don't know, applying all of our understanding. And to me, my focus, I don't care about the rest of you. My focus today is asking you guys questions about what you see from your perspective, what you understand, how... Mm -hmm. And, and, and how you're looking at it from a performance perspective, like how can you figure out how to play the aerial rule better so that you're succeeding on the pitch, you're not giving up penalty corners, you're forcing penalty corners, you're doing all that sort of thing. And we're focusing specifically on aerials into the D. So did you guys have any opening things that you wanted to say about aerials and how much you love umpires and how they handle them? <laughs> uh, I, I, I can start first of all thank you for uh, for the invitation uh, Kelly and, and, and I, don't, I, I definitely am not prepared I didn't come prepared which normally I, I would like to, to do uh, so I will try to to maybe to be to speak the the, the least from the, the the four of us uh, but uh, but definitely will try to, to bring my opinion and my perspective in, in, in the areas I just I, I just think it's a uh, it's a, a very interesting, exciting part of the game, both technically or and as we could see in the last World Cup, tactically is 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 more and more a very big threat. Um, now 
in mid distance and, and power play situations. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to to see and and to to debate. Um, but I don't have anything right now very prepared. So so bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, 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 let me open up with a question for you, though, especially for the coaching perspective. When uh, when we did the, the panel talk during the World Cup, uh, Xavier Recklinger was on, on the show and uh, he, he at, the, at the given moment, told me that he was very surprised that coaches and, and, and players still have not figured out the right way to deal with these incoming aerials into the D. Uh, and especially during that World Cup, we saw, saw several phases there. So, are you dealing with this? How, how are you preparing your players to deal with this incoming D? Leave alone the rules for that moment, but just tactically as well. Right. So, I, I would I would say as that uh, maybe it relates with the point that in the five minutes you gave me before this call, I was already uh, thinking a little bit about. Uh, uh, and, and also because I'm now coming out from the indoor season, so now I, I would dive and I would like to break through a lot of the, the World Cup matches and situations. But one thing one thing for me was very clear, and, and maybe David also experienced that either as, as in a defensive position, but also in the attacking position, that uh, there were a lot of power play situations, so particularly from a long corner range where teams were using this mid balls a lot into the baseline. So you saw that a lot. And and I think that's also related with a conflict that some teams have on switching from zonal systems to man-on-man -man systems. And sometimes it was, it was easy for the, the, the possession team to manipulate some of the teams. So I, I, would, I would say that among other ingredients, the German team did this very well they defend this situation really well and i think that's also related with a certain flexibility they have in their zonal system to adapt when their zonal system when their team came a little bit lower in the pitch so closer to their defensive circle they adapted their zonal system so it was difficult to to find a, a spare or, or a free player in their circle or at least was more difficult than the other teams that that i saw so um, I, I think as overall, it's very much related with when teams come into an attacking power play phase, some of them change from zonal to man, and sometimes in that moment, there are some uh, situations where it's it's possible to manipulate and to find a free player because you saw this a lot in, in the World Cup. I don't know, David, if you, if you had that perception or if it was something that you guys notice also during the world cup but for, for me it was very clear from a superficial observational point of view not not really even, even looking to video tower footage not coding the matches just as as, as a, a neck on a naked high perspective let's say yeah 100 percent agree um i think we find maybe in the lead up to the world cup especially with a few blocks of the pro league that the area was starting to come a little bit more and more especially as you work into like high transfer uh, phase um, but the World Cup was a clear distinction that the aerial is coming more and more into our game uh, especially into the circle um, and you can see and it's exactly as you said the more manipulation from a man-to-man -man system of being able to utilize the aerial was was definitely something that teams were looking to do especially um, maybe a little bit uh, less likely when teams are playing zone and not not many teams are playing deep zone you seen the Germans change their system to like a really deep zone, um, regardless of whether they were down to ten men, um, and, and obviously that seemed to work for them. Um, Belgium, I think, have been playing zone for quite for quite a number of years. Uh, we've been doing a lot of man to man, um, and so yeah, listen, it, it was used, utilized an awful lot, um, and something which you know I, I, I I'd imagine teams, especially us as well, like we've been trying to develop the the range of high ball, but also the height at which an, an aerial is played. So therefore, the defender has no chance to be able to receive it. You can see that teams, if they play the ball uh, as an aerial quite flat, it gives the opportunity for a defender to be able to retreat a couple of yards and be able to essentially pick it or receive it. Now, what you're seeing is that the trajectory or the height of the aerial is getting bigger and bigger to allow no defender any chance to be able to receive um, any balls that are going towards baseline. Um, 
and obviously that's giving giving us more of a problem from an umpire perspective. Um, maybe uh, changing the game a little bit from a defensive point of view that we we as defenders maybe don't have as much say inside our own circle as what we'd want to because the advantage is definitely going towards the, the attackers. So, um, and that's obviously becoming a little bit of a, a conflict between <laughs> between everyone. And, and I think having having left the World Cup, it was probably one of the most talked about discussions, which is great that we're having it because, um, yeah, definitely at times you can see, is this clear? Is this different than what's happened the day before? Is this being used as a referral, rightly or wrongly? Um, yeah, that's that's probably what, what why it's good to have this <laughs> this discussion today. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to jump in here since I'm the one with the buttons, so I can, I, I can press my own scene. Um, I, I really like that comment, David, about the trajectory of the ball being really crucial. And something that I talk about a lot when I'm trying to coach umpires about this is that there are a vast number of differences between that trajectory that that comes flat and low, like you described, or is high and is dropping between or in a different sort of receiving zone. And <clears throat> one of the problems is that. I think we've been taught as umpires through things like five meters off the free hit and things like that to look at five meters as being something that's described around the, on the ground. So it's like a circle that's around a play or a disc that's painted on the ground. And that really doesn't apply when you're talking about the, the ball. The ball is in this 3D space and there's it, it changes what the, what the danger area is, like to make it very simple – like, where is the danger going to occur? That is what's happening in the air according to that trajectory of the ball. And umpires have to adjust to that and be looking at the the ball path rather than the field space. Does that make sense from that perspective? It's yeah, a very, yeah, it's yeah, a completely. different way of looking at it. And that means that an attacker who is in front of their defender and the low trajectory arrows coming at them, they are an initial receiver even though the defender is only three meters behind them, are they in a clear space to receive it? Yes, they are. Because the five meter disc is like this plane. I, I end up doing all these hand motions and it doesn't make any sense, but <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, in, it's in front of them. It's this disc in the air rather than f extending five meters back that way. Cause the ball isn't going there. You know, does that, does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Completely. Okay, cool. Okay. I, I um, just say, I, I yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I add something? Can I add or ask something? Because uh, as as the trend of air hockey and and these aerials are becoming so much more common in the game, uh, I I also see now a lot of situations from the moment that the ball is thrown in the air that there is a lot of uh, how would you say like there is a lot of um, permissivity if you want to the to the. <laughs> To the danger, to the proximity, to the, the, the first player, to the first opponent there. So, uh, I find it interesting. I don't have a, like a, a clear opinion about this, but I, I would say that back in the days or, or, or previously, a lot more situation would be whistle as uh, danger. Uh, I, I don't know now. It's just because it became so common that we need to allow a bit more of. Uh, the situations. So, if you understand what I mean, so I, I'm throwing the the ball, and there is still a person at four meters next to me, and there are so many situations that I, I thought hmm, this this is dangerous. On the other hand, if we want to accept and if we want to allow this as a, such a a big part of our game now, maybe we need to we as umpires, we as agents of the game, we need to close our eyes to to this. To this rule, I think I think a lot of it is based on the, the the interpretation of the rule, and so I think the easiest thing for players at the minute, and I find myself doing this especially, is like we just we always say this, and Kayla, you'll hear me. We just want consistency, which like <laughs> you, you know, which probably umpires whenever they hear that they're thinking I've heard this you know a thousand times over the course of my career, mm -hmm. um, but I. It's, it's probably at the minute the hardest rule for umpires to umpire essentially, but the interpretation of the rule or the way it's written, as I look at it, and probably you'll probably help clear this up a little bit, judge in the moment when the, the almost the rule is saying uh, received, controlled, and on the ground. If that makes sense. So, but, but, David, I'm not. I'm my not, interpretation. I'm not. 
sorry, sorry. Go on, sorry. No, go on. So now at this moment, I wasn't talking at the stage that is the most interesting stage here, but the, in the receiving stage, I'm, I'm talking about the, yeah. the moment where the players throw the ball and you see an opponent that needs to kind of, uh, needs to, okay. to get away from the, the, the trajectory of the ball. So that, that was my, yeah. that was my question here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Th th so, that's yeah. a really good point, though, David, because that's one of the questions that uh, that's come up in the comments here. Uh, this controlled on the ground. So, so Kat here, she she just did a um, a practice hoof class match yesterday. Very proud of her, and she's saying um, she wants to understand, you know, and and I'd love to hear, you know, David and B about your opinions on this. What control looks yeah. like because this whole receive controlled and on the ground thing. I mean, frankly, I think the rule is extremely outmoded for what you guys are able to do these days because you can fully control the ball without it even ever touching the ground. I mean, I've seen many players receiving and just cradling on the stick and then being able to go off and, and you know, do a, do a lacrosse move or hurley or whatever, or receive yep. 3D in your 3D dribbling or one bounce and it comes back up onto your stick and then you're moving it off in different directions. And I think that's yeah. where umpires are getting tripped up, especially at those high levels, is that yeah. how do we know what a mishandle is and what is control and an actual intentional, I'm trying to move this ball on or off into this different space because that's where I'm going to try to eliminate a defender. Do, do, you, do you see what I mean with that? Yeah, no, no, completely. And I think... Um... I think this is where it's becoming even harder for defenders and attackers are getting really smart. So like, I, I could, as an attacker, receive the ball, potentially, and drop it straight down to on the floor, essentially. Yeah. So to me, that would be controlled, re receive, controlled it on the floor. So therefore, yeah. if, I'm, if, the, if the defender is five meters away and I've done that, then by all means, they should be allowed to encroach and be able to tackle sort of thing because I've gone, received, ball on the floor. But if I just receive the ball and let the ball bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce does the defender have to wait until the ball is on the floor or yeah. do, do you know what i mean so there's there's a lot of like gray areas also what's happening now and i think this is becoming more and more you'll see from the i think from the world cup final um the area that comes across with two minutes to go to the sluver instead of receiving the ball he his first touch takes him forward towards the defender yeah whilst bouncing sort of thing so therefore it's like as an offender you're thinking what, literally, what can you do? Because if you think you're five meters from potentially the trap that he's going to do outside the circle by just trapping it, he therefore then plays the ball forward towards you. You have no hope. Like you, you genuinely have no hope of being able to. And then, what do you do? Do you do you stand in the way and take a, a hit to avoid a free shot, or do you back off five, knowing either somebody's going to get absolutely smashed for this, or he's probably just going to end up scoring, sort of thing. And that's the that's the real hard bit for defenders is we just yeah. you just don't know like is, is it on is on the ground literally on the ground or is it any mistouch and it's bouncing is that still classes on the ground um and that's where it's becoming and again very hard for umpires because of the way it's the way the rule is um the way the rule is uh, written yeah uh, well, absolutely. I, I think also i think that's also and 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 again i, I think it will be difficult to to get some closed conclusions in certain areas of, of, of this rule. Uh, but I think that's also, now if I step back from a coach and someone that is uh, watching hockey every day, I think it, it is also, it seems a bit a counter-natural situation that a defender cannot approach, cannot challenge the ball or needs to really kind of restrain himself, particularly when there is a possibility there is a possibility that me as an attacker, I, I, I control the ball and, and right away smash the ball into goal. So I, I think this is a this is a situation where we, we really need to understand where we can go and and bringing the, the, this rule into a more dynamic and more and also more aligned with the rest of our game because in in, in no other area I need to to freeze myself yes. and, and not <laughs> challenge. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It, and I, it, I it, think, Keely, oh. in my sorry, in my, in my opinion, I would love, I would love the rule to be a little bit of. I know we have to receive, controlled, on the ground, etc. I think if you, as a defender, because you're inside your own defensive circle, therefore, 
you, you should you should be allowed to defend your circle. If if an aerial comes to an attacker and I'm standing five meters away, and it's a five meters away, and he touches the ball, regardless of where he touches it, I should be allowed to put pressure on because I'm still five meters. Regard it doesn't matter if his touch is really good. If he has a really bad touch and it takes him backwards, that you know he still has a little bit of an advantage because I can't ultimately go and close him down until the ball is on the floor. So therefore, as a defender inside your own circle, you, you're just allowing free shots, you're allowing free plays, you're allowing him to get his eyes up and be able to pass across the circle. So would I like to see, regardless of, if I'm five metres away and Ariel comes and I res and the attacker receives the ball, I should be allowed to go and, and go and challenge because it's up to him to receive it perfectly. You know, I can't I can't say when, you know, when is a good uh, receive and when's a bad receive. You know, that's, that's not part of, of my defensive duties. That's, not, not what I'm there for, essentially. So, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. So I think so. I've I've just sort of amended this, and and this this honestly, like when I'm when I'm talking about these plays and I'm I'm coaching up players, I am talking about this, saying the on the ground thing. You know, don't even it, at most levels of play, the, the notion of it being on the ground was what we used to understand would make it safe, but now we know that that's not the case. And of course, that will vary from level to level, which is um, a point that that uh, Matt here made that that it's got to work for all levels of hockey. Well, welcome to hockey. Like everything that we do when we're interpreting as umpires, and I have umpired absolutely every level from all the way from the the, the top international, all the way down to well, <laughs> my local hockey, and. I know how to be able to adjust what I'm calling based on what the players need in order to be safe. Because again, the, the principle behind this rule is we're just trying to make sure nobody dies. And we're, tr we're trying to make sure everybody can go to work the next day. So if, if we keep that in mind as our guide and principle, but I, I, do, I, do, I do like this, or even if the notion of control is enough. So if we if we take this out and we look at received and controlled and just just leave off the on, on the ground if we could amend that because control could mean being on the ground if you're an under 12 it could mean you know that it, the ball is simply that first touch as you described david that that's that's all it takes so um that's an interesting idea do do we want to maybe go to that um uh i, I, would, I would like to challenge here then then Kelly, okay that is uh uh, well, because I think this is a very important question. How can we standardize this, the, the understanding, and, and regardless of different levels and so on? So I think this is a, it's a difficult question to answer for sure, but, but it's an, an important question. You are also right by saying, okay, welcome to OK, because we have, we have that a lot in our sport, and, and that also, also makes our sport so, so multi layered and so fun and so exciting, sure. But then my challenge, okay, what's controlled then? What, what is controlled? Yeah, that is my question. Yeah. What could be considered uh, yeah. or what would be unanimous, unanimously accepted as controlled? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, 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 think that's the, I think that's the issue. If you're, if you're, if you're at international level, <laughs> ideally you're going to be deemed that you should be able to control a high ball. That's, I, I know everyone, it's not always going to happen. That's just not part of it and part of sport it just doesn't happen but you're almost penalizing a defender for an attacker who miscontrols an aerial and still can't defend his own circle because he has to wait and i i think that's becoming a little bit of the issue it's almost the whole the ascendancy is on the attacker so i'd essentially have to wait for him to receive it is it controlled yes it's controlled is it on the floor Yes, it's on the floor, and by that time, somebody's putting it onto their backhand and firing it across the circle, sort of thing. And I and I have no hope. There's just no point in me being there. Um, I I do get what you mean. I, I do get with that bit, but like, and again, I'm more thinking international level, so it's harder to then justify with the younger generation and you know your your junior age groups and your um, even your junior nag system is what is controlled, but. That's up to the attacker. You know, that's that's where they've got to get better. If we're trying to get better at our defending and blocking and and, and our circle, yeah, defense um, and anything that happens with that, then surely then we have to keep encouraging players to make sure it's controlled because therefore it makes it the safest way. If it's uncontrolled, then it becomes surely more dangerous for <laughs> for everyone. Yeah, and and I'm just bringing in uh, Fraser's comments here, boss of hockey, because 
you know, Fraser is a club level player who's sort of in that middle range of, you know, not quite top domestic level, not international, but, you know, very aware of hockey and, and all that sort of thing. You know, he reads that rule and he says, well, oh, I can't, I can't be tackled unless the ball's on the ground. That seems a little unfair. And, and clearly that's not with the understanding even that, you know, players who don't actually look at the rule book on a regular basis, he's like, whoa, I didn't really know this. So that's, that's not the way we would apply it. You know, Fraser, we would, yeah. it, as an umpire, as soon as I feel and I'm applying my understanding of what players are doing and saying, oh, it's David Ames, he's received that ball, and if he, if he deflects it off to the side, I'm more likely and I'm highly likely to determine that he wanted to do that. That's not an accident, right? So I would be doing that, you know, that, that calculation in my head. But um, if that were a, you know, a club level player in Calgary here, I'd be like, oh, that's a complete accident. They totally didn't want to do that. That's a mishandle. And that changes everything. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I, I think, you know, Matt here has got this definition control of being able to continue to play in a safe way. That goes back to what the principle is, is just all of this is about, about safety and things. Here's, here's a question for you two um, before we get to our first clip example, because, and you alluded to it, we're going to look at uh, Belgium, Germany in the final of the World Cup, and then uh, every other clip is about England, I think. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the question I have is, I hear a lot of coaches and players calling for almost like an abolition of the error rule. Like, can't we just call it on safety? Can't we just call it on safety? Is that something that you believe? And what do you think that would look like? Because I think we're moving there. We're just moving little bit by bit, you know, just, just scaling back the rules step by step. What does that look like to you two? And, you know, what do you, what do you think that, how that could look? Does that terrify you, David, as a player? Do you think, holy crap, like I need something there. If I'm if I'm the initial receiver as a defender in my deep end, I don't want to have somebody running at me. I'm thinking that some kind of space is useful to have as a protective area. What do you think? Yeah, no, no I, I think it has. I mean, you, we're looking at creating more danger if that is the case, Kaylee. Yeah, and, and I think if you want to apply the rule to uh, from junior the whole way up, then that could be that could be quite messy. So it yeah. could, um, yeah. I agree. Yeah, Bernardo, what do you think? I, I know we've I, had I conversations think, about this, so I can't wait to hear what you <laughs> what you're going to say on the record. I can, no, I, I can briefly mention uh, about that that disagreement or, or that uh, that part because I, I I like at least to to bring that up, bring that into the mix, let's say. But before that, uh, I would say that in cert in certain situations in the in the World Cup. I, I saw a very loose criteria that was basically uh, if a player touches in the ball, uh, we allow the challenge to happen, right? So that, that was maybe the most um, loose, the most uh, open interpretation of, of the, the, this rule. Uh, not so much into the circle, of course, because in, in the circle there is a little bit more uh, th the situation is a bit more careful and you don't want to risk to to go too early or you don't want to risk to challenge because you misinterpreted if the opponent player controlled or not. So again, the big, the, the big question is always what is control? And, 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 and it's so subjective, but maybe we need to find a, a stupid way to, to, to really define what is control is, is a number of touches is, 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 is the height of the receiving is a time uh, frame. I don't know. I'm saying something that is, is stupid, but now is also stupid that we cannot bring some concrete definition to this um, because it creates more uh, disagreement than agreement, right? Because yeah. if it goes against me, I don't like it and I disagree. But if it goes in my favor, I close my eyes, kind of. I'm putting this in a very stupid analogy. Um, so I, I don't have a clear answer to to that, uh, uh, but but I, I think the, the safety needs to be a point here, and we cannot just remove that. Otherwise, it can be reckless. I mean, 
I, I prepare a shot, David comes running to me and I still smash the ball. And I think we need to have some kind of, a, 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 yeah, some definition, some regulation, some guidelines. And again, I know, Kelly, you don't like this. And I also, I, I, I don't know, I, I didn't dive fur, further into considering this, but is it that we, we would need some protective headgear? And I know this sounds stupid, and but if the game and the rules and the technique and the speed is evolving, we need to keep on asking ourselves how can we keep, how we can st sustain the speed and the flow of the game. And now I'm getting back a little bit Ernst, to the conversation. I saw part of the conversation about dry artificial pitch. And I think we all like the pace of our game. I, I mean, it's it's fantastic, right? Also, when I bring some friends mm -hmm. that they are they know hockey, they, they 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 are amazed. So I think we need to sustain that, and we need to sustain aerial hockey because it's it's fantastic to watch. You know, it's it's so cool to watch this aerial passes, aerial receivings. So I think I would say we need to safe keep that. But I don't have now a concrete answer. What's the best way to regulate that? And I think this conversation is caused by being so difficult to, to define that as well, right? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Yeah. We're we've got some really good comments coming in and and suggestions like Catherine asking here. Um, should the question be? I'm trying to bring it up on the broadcast. There we go. Um, is five meters the right zone? Maybe we have to look at a different distance. The, you know, do you need a full five meters or do you only need three? Do you only need two? Um, I mean, I, I know how tall some of y'all are and <laughs> I'd be a little concerned about how far you can reach with your stick if, if five meters isn't there. Here's Kat thinking about whether a number of touches. So you, you sort of get a number of touches before that goes. Um, and let's see. It's Mark always here. very linear. Sorry, Kiel. It, it always sounds very linear to me, like number of touches or number of time, because I, I would like the, the rules as open as possible. <laughs> but I'm ju I just want to challenge how we could find a better definition to, to control. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Here's, here's a, the last one before we go look at a clip. Um, Kampong, I, I can't read that. Jude. Uh, is the most easy this is Bert de Boer. <laughs> so it's it's kind of french but it's not french okay cool uh <laughs> the most easy solution <laughs> is receive the below the shoulder only which that's kind of interesting so instead of looking at how much distance you have it's that you can't we go back to not being able to play the ball above the shoulder i don't know yeah it, no, I, I, I think i think i no, but I, I think that makes sense in 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 a, in, in a way, uh, and I know that that a lot will disagree. But uh, for me, in all honesty, we need to keep the game flowing, and there will always be discussions if we bring the five meters to three meters or to seven meters, or we say there has to be three touches or two touches or. Uh, it has to be flat and still on the ground or not. There will always be discussion. And the reason why we have this rule is to eliminate danger. So I am for just allowing, and I, I hate it in all other aspects of the game, but in this case, just allow the umpire to assess, is there danger? And, and, and use their best judgment. And there will be then different situations at high level hockey or in junior hockey or recreational hockey, which is fine because th these are different situations. The danger is different in a, a top game versus a, 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 a junior game. Just let common sense from an umpire be the judge. Is this dangerous? Yes or no. And then remove all the five meters, remove all the difficulties of what is control what is not control um and, and and bring it back to something simple is it dangerous or not and yes it's a judgment and it is it's not objective but yeah hey uh, there's discussion now as well with objective rules or or, or options yeah absolutely. so why not just bring it back to that and then maybe the the, the, the suggestion from, from Bert de Boer, from Kampong, 
with okay receive only on, under the shoulder yeah there, there is some valid points in that i think but uh, for, for me it is the most important is just let them decide is it danger or is it not danger because that will create the most of flow in the game i think okay but okay uh, i'm not a coach i'm not a player no, <laughs> I'm no, not an umpire. But, but you're a, but you're a respected observer commentator and and you've been around long enough so we we get it um yeah. Sorry, so, Kelly, so, so, yeah go ahead can i can i just comment something that ends uh, because i i agree with you Ernst, but um but it's not just because it's danger it's because sometimes it feels counter natural to the logic of the game uh, so as it is now as it is currently right so it's it's not just because it, it dangers now we try to implement this rule to to because of safety reasons which should be a primordial reason but it also creates a very it creates a counter natural situation now where where i'm restrained for challenging a ball which doesn't happen in any other area of the game so i can always challenge you if you if you carry the ball i i should be always free to challenge you so um but 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 yeah i, I agree with you i agree with you um, but then you always allow some discussions about the criteria of the empire a and the criteria of the empire b and can also be a very endless discussion <laughs> Absolutely, but I think I think that that it becomes something where we just have to accept that is is a judgment call from the umpire in that part of the field, and I I, I hate that situation in any other kind of uh, part of the field or or part of the game, but here I think it is the only way if you want a free flowing game, I think it's the only way that we just have to accept that okay guys this is going to be a judgment call by the umpire and sometimes we will agree and sometimes we will not agree it, it, that's the case today as well so why not remove yeah. the restrictions yeah yeah okay David, you much, disagree. Or, yeah first i think it's as much again easier said than done because probably on one day which you'll have seen in the world cup which i think somebody just uh asked was there any controversies or was there any like differences of maybe one day being given a, a PC via a referral and the next day not given a PC via referral, um, which is something probably I'd be not keen to speak about today, but something I definitely thought about that we should be doing better with the referral. I know you've had it, Katie, with, with Creedy um, as well. You've spoken about it, so but that'd be something different. But that's that's the hard bit is you maybe have someone in the video, uh, video booth who thinks completely different to someone the next day. Um, which I think at times we had during the World Cup, um, which we might we might see in the video. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's do that. Let's dive into the videos now. So, Candice, what happened was I I obviously pulled from my vast library of clips of a few things, and just so happens coincided with a few clips that David also provided. Uh, you know, just from his own experience, obviously. So it means we are vastly overrepresented with England clips. But let's let's start off with this one with uh, from the final with and Belgium Lauren. and Germany, and, and just up, get your thoughts on this one. Oh, the shot is a dangerous one from De Slova. It wasn't going on target. And hopefully, it's here. Van Dorn throws this it's not too loud. I like having the commentators because when the commentators talk it's shaping how fans and, and, and are perceiving the, the, the calls they're the usually very wrong Muller. usually <laughs> and certain certain comment like you know mace gets it more right than a lot and that sort of thing but the ball, the then... and then he's trying to go back as well i i, th I think that's the hard one there kid which i spoke about previously is the receive going forward towards a defender makes it pretty much impossible for you to defend it like you, you, you might as well. I'm surprised that this, and this is why this wasn't given a corner almost instantly, because you, you don't really have that much of an advantage from it if you look at it. Um, and also, then, like somebody almost nearly gets killed here. Um, oh, so, yeah. I mean, the shot's uh, terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the but thing. That's, it's, a, that's almost it's, a different um, issue, right? Yeah, no, completely. But I think this had to go to a referral, I think, for that. It which did. I, so I, you think in this yeah. case that by default, this 
like this play, this should have been a corner right away. You would expect this to be given as a corner. Yes, because it's, it's pretty much impossible for, for a defender to defend because his first touch takes him forward towards it. But doesn't that mean that the that the defender's done the right thing at that moment? They're five when it goes, and then it's the attacker's choice and responsibility to play that ball forward, and the defender yeah, should be penalized for that? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree, but, I, but yeah. I'm, I'm going by the principle of the rules, essentially. Would, would I like this to just play on? Essentially, the defender can almost intercept it now because he's, a, he's played it towards him 100%. Right. That's, I think, the way it should be played, but not within the rules that we're um, right. being asked to do at the minute. Yeah. So, what, what do yeah. you think, Bernardo, about this play? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a complex it's a complex one because I, I hear both of you, but I, I think it again g- goes back to what is controlled because here there is a clear intention in the first touch to, 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 to get the ball forward, not really to get the ball in, into the player's skill area, as you want to call it. So uh, do you consider that in this first touch he is bringing the ball within the five meters distance? Okay, that... It's it's a it's a tough one. For me, if we are talking about flow and if we are talking about being flexible, I, I'd say that the, the defender can approach the ball if there is a clear attention, and that's what feels to me that there's a clear attention for the ball to be played towards the defender there. So I would, as an umpire, luckily I'm not, I would close my eyes to this. I, w- I would not consider this a penalty corner. Yeah. But me, that I like flow and, and I'm very bad umpire, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's music to my ears, Bernardo. That's music. And, and on, honestly, David, for me, uh, if I had my druthers about me, I would have let this play on. Because yeah. I... Maybe this is my defender heart talking, but I don't think that any defender here should be penalized because the ball yeah, gets agree. played towards them. Agreed. And let, let's see if this is, um, uh, yeah, let's let's go to this one. When this actually happened in your game, we were having a watch party and every umpire in there groaned when y- your team went to referral on this. Because... There weren't a lot of people who thought that you had a leg to stand on. <laughs> and, and I mean you as in like yeah. a team, not not yeah. not you in particular. So so here we were looking at, you know, there's that initial touch. And from each angle, it does look slightly different. I think, you know, I see this right here. Okay, there's the five that's initially given. And then you have this tower footage and it makes it look a little bit different as angles always do. What, what did you guys think about this situation? I think, and again, I'm probably being very specific on the rule. If it says you can't be within five of the receiver, mm-hmm. to me, he, to me, he never is five at any moment that he receives the ball. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, so if we're saying yeah, that it's received I, I, and controlled and on the floor, I, you know, I, I, in, in all honesty, I would love this just to play on. I, I actually, you know, when I when I look at it, I'm like, yes, this is the way I would like the rule to be played. But by the rule that it's we're seeing at the minute and what we're being given, yeah. you have to have given the receiver five meters. And to me, he was never five meters, which arguably then is like, why isn't it a corner? Because you don't really have that much of an advantage unless you swing. Um, if that makes sense. Right. I, I mm-hmm. want to say I want to say that first of all, I want to say that is a. It's a very nice uh, technical execution either in the pass and, and in the receiving. So like the, the, the point where the ball is dropping is exactly in the baseline. So that, that, that was very, very nice to see. But also what is interesting in, in this kind of situation or in this situation is in the first video angle that you bring, I feel that the, the, the white defender is not very conscious about someone leading into his back, which change in the video tower footage, you really, you really see that the white defender adjusts his position a little bit because he feels there is someone. So if you want, again, if you want to be criterious and going by the book, as David says, okay, then this might not be a five meter, within five meter distance. Yeah. And that, that, that's that's the whole that's the whole issue with it, isn't it, uh, Kaylee? It's just like, yeah. The, the rule makes it so hard for umpires to 
on par, yeah. <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Because I think we'd, we'd all like this to be played on. And this is probably where I'm, I'm thinking is, to me, when he, when um, when our player receives it, he, he hasn't been encroached, essentially. So he hasn't tried to win it as soon as he's controlled it, essentially. As soon as he's effectively, well, potentially had control, then he's able to put pressure on, which I, which I like because, because defensively inside your circle, you still got to be able to defend. Mm -hmm. you know? But if we're going back to the rule in terms of what we all said, if you have to be five meters from the receiver, to me, he's never five. For, for any for any part of it, even though he maybe backs off one step, even if he still backs off one step, I still don't think he's five. Yeah, you know what? And I, yeah, it, and I think I think it's close because for me, it, you know, the, the angle gets flattened when we look at it this way because obviously we know from this mark to this mark, that's five, right? That's yeah. that's a yeah. established fact. We, we know this is nine. Somebody's <laughs> going to correct me. God, I hate it when I'm under pressure and I say things wrong. But... But that actually doesn't look far off five. It's five. It's, it's you know, and, and umpires, I think, when we go to video referral and we start looking at whether, you know, the ball has traveled five before it's come straight into the circle and things like that, we, we get so particularly technical about trying to measure it out. But an umpire in this situation is just going to be saying, is that five-ish? <laughs> because... Who the hell knows? Because we know that the angles change absolutely everything about what we're we're perceiving. So I don't know. That's that's well, really well, tough. Well, what well, I look at is what the defender does, and that the defender, you know, waits clearly, sort of plants, and then the reception, and he actually then retracts himself again a second time. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. That it it, it just sort of gives me the sign that the defender is trying to give you the the giving give the attacker the space does that make sense yeah yeah no which, which also, like us. Yeah. Yeah. what do you think b was that you or is was that ernst no i i just wanted to to, to comment on what you said that the the five ish because <laughs> uh, in all the whole, no no because I, I because i think we need to have the same standard for that and it's like we all uh, find it more exciting that the empire at a higher level being first divisions or international hockey, it's more in the ish, right? In the five-ish, there's a stick tackle, but close your eyes, uh, let it roll. So if we appreciate that and if we think that's better for a game, then we also need to be flexible in these kind of situations here, right? So as you say, it's five-ish, it's five, you know? And I think uh, I, I like that more or I, in terms of letting the, 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 the ball roll, then to be super criteria here. I, I know it is, it isn't solve our problem, but just if we have a measure for international for high level okay that we allow and close our eyes to certain situations, then let's use that standard always then, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I'm just, I'm, kidding. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being stubborn, but I'm going back to the rules. So if the rule is saying it has to be on the ground, so to me, when is the ball on the ground? Like the ball probably, if you're if you're being specific, the ball's on the ground now. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's, I, he's I totally five. understand that's the, what that's you the real hard bit. Yeah. That's the hard bit for umpires. <laughs> yeah. But like, the problem if, there, Gavin, is that the player could let the ball bounce and smash the ball in the yeah, air. 100%. <laughs> and that's, yeah, 100%. Agree. That's that's what I said. That's what I said at the very beginning. Yeah. Is you could yeah. you can an attacker just like let the ball bounce and that just keep bouncing yeah. and bouncing and bouncing and that's the again it's a little bit of how the, the rule is written. Like what does yeah. it mean on yeah. the ground? Is it the first bounce? Is it like it has to be on the floor because that's the ball on the floor now and he's within two meters less than two. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is controlled and on the ground, but yeah. control arguably happened. <laughs> You know, okay, there. not the first. We wouldn't say the first reception. I mean, that's kind of a dicey one. That's a, that's a tough reception. But I'd say this touch. This touch is control, for me. Yeah. Which you know still seems a little bit. It still seems a little bit hard. Like I have I have a lot of empathy for all of the, you know, the players here trying to sort it out. Yeah. I don't know. Let's let's go to the one where you were directly involved because <laughs> I can't wait to hear what you 
<laughs> Listen to the commentators just <laughs> shit talking. You hear though, it's the best. Realizes he, he can't allow him the free shot. <laughs> so he... Well, I, 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 I think though that sometimes this is difficult because the ball wasn't trapped perfectly either. And if if they don't bring it down perfectly, there's the ball that's thrown. He doesn't trap well, it perfectly. It's definitely five, isn't he? Well, that's a, a difficult one. Ames knew what he was doing. He wasn't going to give him a, an easy chance. You knew what you were doing, David. <laughs> you knew what you were doing. <laughs> and that's coming from the great Rick Salford. <laughs> Just saying, his telepathy is fantastic. The <laughs> there you go. So so t tell me, David, what did you think about this in the moment and how it happened? You looked really happy about the call. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, again, it's a little bit of like how I would like it to be played, where... I feel like I'm in no position to tackle when he first receives it, when he receives it. But like, ultimately, I can't, I can't stay five and let this guy have a free shot. Um, yeah, exactly. Am I within five on his receive? I think I probably maybe am, but like, his yeah. control isn't that great, and it goes backwards. So therefore, like, I again, when do I wait to put pressure on, on him? Yeah. Essentially, it's I, to me this is a little bit of a tough one, and I think potentially it could be because I never really stop. Or my, my momentum never really, um, like I never slow down essentially. But if his touch is not bad, but it's a, a little bit like not great and it goes backwards slightly, why should I have to wait until he's fully in control to be able to put pressure on inside my own circle? Yeah. And I, I'm not even sure how much of a mishandle that is. I think that's a, you know, that's a bit of a, oh, I'm actually going to, you know, let this ball you know, he, he does receive it a bit behind him. And he doesn't look like, oh, crap, the ball's gone behind me. It's just like, oh, this is a good way to generate a different angle in the circle and a different space. And, yeah. and no, he's, but, but he's, in the, he's in the air, he's jumping when he does that. So so yeah. he needed to kind of cushion the ball somehow. The ball right. needed to be a bit more yeah. because he's, he's fully in the air. Yeah. But again, it, it comes back to my point, especially with the first one, if it's it's not on the ground. Therefore, it should be a penalty corner, similar to the first clip we just yeah. said. But that again, that's the, if we that's go by the, the right. Yeah, but yeah. I, I think I think uh, you're getting a lot of empathy. Uh, like I certainly feel yeah. empathy here, and and a lot of the umpires that are chiming into the chat here, they're all saying no. I mean, I would let this play on, and I think that's that's kind of that's nice to hear because it's it's good to hear that umpires are thinking about. You know, not applying rules strictly and officiously, but looking at what do you actually need in the game in order to stay safe, to execute your skills, and to show off what you could do. Because that's that's why we're there is to let you guys do what you can do in in the basketball. Kelly, one question: do we, yeah. do we know when the five meter rule and which year was that implemented? For aerials? Yeah. I mean. I I, I not don't take you as the encyclopedia, encyclopedia here. No, okay, it's, but it's that might, might be two thousand. It's been in the rule book for a long time, like a lot longer than as a player and then umpire coming up. Like I didn't really know this stuff existed, but it, it's been in the rule book a long time. Maybe somebody in the comments can, you know, come on, cat, do some research. Yeah, it might, it might be interesting <laughs> to to yeah. understand because. It's, now five meters, it feels a bit too far in the high, in the highest level. It feels just, I yeah. mean, the conclusion here: if if David doesn't challenge or approach this, the Spanish attacker can just smash a ball into the goal without being challenged, and we don't want that. It doesn't make sense for the log in, in the logic of the game, right? So it might be something for us to reconsider. Maybe three meters, I don't know, a, a shorter a shorter radio there. Yeah. So Edward and Kat are both, uh, and they're saying 2009. So, uh, okay. That's, that's good to know. That's interesting. No, that was, a while ago. That was yeah. a while ago. Sticks okay. were not so yeah. powerful. The areas were not so common. You know? No, absolutely. Like the whole way, I mean, self-pass, the fact that you guys can aerial on the move, you can 
you know, yeah. b- back when I started playing and we were doing aerials, remember how you had to, you had to move the ball to one meter and it had to be pushed <laughs> yeah, to your yeah. friend who would stand in front of you taking the free hit and then it would stop and then you would aerial it and it would only go vertically up the pitch. You would never even, you would never even think about using an angle. You would just like, okay. And you would inevitably just put the ball straight into the player's defender's face who was right in front of you because it was such a stationary <laughs> static play. Okay, maybe that was just me. I don't know, but there you go. That, that's interesting. Here, l- let me show you a couple that I pulled out from my collection um, that were kind of interesting. Silas Lagerman. Then the overhead ball thrown up underneath. Is there opportunity on the backhand? Really good individual skill. That's a super. And that's so. So this is Sarah EHL, and I think it's it's interesting because she's taken the first touch as being the moment of control. And I think she's reading that based on the body language of the attacker looking like super like, okay, I've touched the ball, but now I'm looking up, I'm assessing my options. Just like you were talking about, David, he's got enough time to get his eyes up. So we can consider that control and he's electing to let the ball bounce. And it seems to me from this that the players are like, yeah, let's go. This is fine. Nobody's mad. Nobody's calling for a penalty corner. Nobody's, you know, fussing at all. What, what do you think about this one, David? Because this certainly isn't controlled on the ground in five meters. No, I, yeah. Again, <laughs> do, I, do, I, do I want this? Like, I think Sarah, Sarah's made a good soon, I think. Um, but again, I, just, I keep coming back to the rule. It's like, it's hard to really... Um, yeah, it's it's hard to really when you read, you read the rule what is what is controlled, what's on the ground. Um, if we're saying on the ground, then it's probably a corner. But I actually think this is the way it should be played. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think this. Uh, I mean, just just thinking on on as we speak. Um, either we need to standardize that after the first touch, you need to be able to challenge the ball. And that, and that means that, but but the first touch, yeah. After the first touch, you need to be able to challenge the ball, so you, you're required to have a, a good technical execution there. Or we need to, I would say, we need to ensure to, a little bit the the, the radio uh, to to approach the ball at least inside of the circle. It's it's an interesting thought because it puts, I mean, one of the things that we're we keep touching on and from David's perspective is the really unfair balance here that the defender doesn't know when control is, doesn't know when they can close and they need to be able to, to defend. And the one touch rule would really put the onus on the attacker to have the skill to do something with the ball. Like they would have to now it's like, okay, I know that as soon as I touch this, then it's, you know, I'm going to be closed. Somebody's going to which happens in the, in the pitch. You know, okay, which happens in, in in the rest of the game. Yeah. You know, if you, you mistrap the ball, you lose the ball. Uh, yeah. If you don't control the ball, you, you cannot play on. Uh, so it it, it it feels that is way too unbalanced or way too unfair inside of the circle from a defensive perspective at this moment right now, where the where the skill is advancing. Uh, so much, and we are we are not allowing the, the defender, the defense player, to to challenge the ball. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Here, Matt saying players, umpires play to the rules, so there should be no ambiguity. We're now thinking of letting players play on as long as they are safe. D- Matt, I'm I'm sort of talking about what I see the future being because I hear this in conversations so much with top level people that they're calling for this complete like. Why do we even, I mean, I've, I've heard coaches on podcasts and, and in articles and stuff saying, why do we even have this rule? Like, let's just call it on safety, which I think what I've heard from everybody else here is like, um, well, no, Ernst is like, sure, let's go. But Bernardo and David have both said, I don't think that's going to happen just quite yet. But what, what I think is interesting, one of the things that I, I talk to is about the development of hockey culture. When you think about this sport, if you know nothing about it and you watch it and you go, how is it that nobody dies? Because here are sticks and the ball is flying around at this incredible rate of speed and it's it looks like it's savagely dangerous 
oh, oh, how is it that nothing happens? And it's because we grow up as players in the game, understanding what we can do that makes things safe and what makes them dangerous. And we generally don't do the dangerous stuff. The worst games to umpire, I think everybody in the, in the chat would agree that those are games where you have a novice adult player who doesn't know anything <laughs> about the sport comes in and maybe they're informed by football. Maybe they're informed by ice hockey, <laughs> lacrosse, whatever they come into the sport and they, and they're crazy. We're, we're just like, Whoa, do not do any of the things that you just did. You are going to, and, and we panic, right? We feel this fear because they are not behaving the way that our culture has evolved. And what I see is this general sort of step-by-step -step relaxation of the rules is leaving the aerial ball and the safety of it to the culture and saying, okay, everybody kind of gets this now. Let's step it back a little bit and people can, people are more trustworthy to do the safe thing. Okay. It's been a couple more years now. Now we can step it back again. I don't know if I'm imparting too much um, intentionality on the <laughs> part of the rules committee. I may well be. But this, this is how I think of it. This is what I see. But I, I, I know that the fear is, you know, every time that all chaos is going to break loose. Like, remember when we went from not being able to play above the shoulder to being able to use our sticks above the shoulder and how many people said this is going to be absolute dogs and cats living together? And it actually worked out pretty well, generally, you know? That's, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Keep keep the game flowing. Keep the game flowing, and and have a judgment. Is it dangerous or not? Yeah, that, exactly. that's that's for me. Hey, yeah, hey, Kili, we've been talking for for more or less an hour now. So so, uh, are, are there specific stuff that we need to get through still, or what I would like to close off otherwise with? But if if we're not there yet, we're not there yet. But I would like to hear from from both David and from from Bernardo and from you, what should the rule be? <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> David, I, I think I think players, players have to go first. Players have to go first. <laughs> I, I think I just said it at the very very beginning. Um, I would love to see a defender that is five meters away from an attacker. As soon as he touches the ball, I should be allowed to encroach and defend my own circle. Pretty much, which I think we, Fernando just um, said it briefly there a couple of minutes ago. I, I I feel like that's the best case scenario for one an improvement of an attacker to make sure that your ball is controlled and you're in charge of it, and two, it gives license for a defender who is five meters away to now defend his own circle rather than having so much advantage at the minute given to an attacker to be able to either get his eyes up and pass or shoot the angles correct or yeah that type. So that's ultimately what I would like to see. Yeah, five or five ish. Five yards. We don't. Five do yards. Yard. Now you're making it even more difficult. We five don't meters. do yards. Come we on. do meters, David. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I was like so in love with everything that you said until you brought in the, the, the <laughs> system. Damn it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Bernardo. Person. Yeah, Bernardo, your thoughts um, on what should be the rule? Uh, I mean, I, I'm re repeating myself, but I, on, and also agreeing with, with uh, David, I, I would say the same. I mean, uh, also looking to these uh, uh, clips and also looking to, to the, the real life, okay, make it, or at least at a reasonable, good, maybe senior or, or high level, junior level, make it after the first touch. Uh, that's control. You have a first touch. That's control because uh, the, the players are developing so many, so much aerial skill in the passing and in the receiving that it feels wrong that we still give such an advantage to the to the attacking player inside of the circle. So make it one touch as a criteria of control and make it five-ish in a good level and maybe five in a not so good level. Keely, your thoughts as an umpire, what should be the rule? Don't um, tell me we agree, Keely. Bernardo, <laughs> I, that is exactly the thought that's running through my head is how do I, 
How do I sit wow. here and actually say I agree with Bernardo Fernandez? This is, this is a shocking thing. It's okay. it's but, but no, for, for a change, <laughs> for an absolute change. But but I I I really like this because I've had the opportunity to hear you know what David's had to say, what you've had to say, and Ernst, and bringing that all together and applying it to what we saw in the clips. I actually do like this first touch idea a lot. And, you know, Catherine brings up the point here that, you know, how would you umpire this in a mid-level domestic game? When you think about the arrow reception, like forget about where it came from, but once the ball has been touched, most players aren't receiving aerials, especially at the lower levels over up here. They're actually receiving aerials more like their shoulder, chest height, midriff, that sort of thing. And if somebody is 3D skilling it, if they are, if the ball for whatever reason has been deflected up into that kind of space, we do allow competition for that ball with just sort of general safety, like don't be a jerk about it, ideas. So if you take away where the ball came from and the ball is now touched by a player at that point, would I expect there to be a fair, safe competition for the ball? I would. So as long as that initial five meters is given. So yeah, I get to the same conclusion that you both do as well. And I mean, who knows, maybe Ernst is, are we going to go four for four on this? Wow. <laughs> no, I, I, th I think it makes sense. I think it makes sense. Uh, absolutely. I like what, uh, especially David's approach uh, here, j j just the first touch and then let the defender storm in. Uh, I think that, that, that would be fine. In all honesty, I think they, you will still have situations where, like for example, the the the, the first clip call with uh, with uh, Arthur de Slover, where his first touch is a bouncing ball towards the defender. Yeah, will, will that again create danger? Will that create now? It's just three D play and play on. That on different levels of the game, I think will will still create a lot of discussion. Um, so therefore, yeah, and, and you know me, I, I am stubborn. I, I will stick to, to my own view and uh, let them be the judge. Is it dangerous or is it not dangerous? <laughs> Absolutely. That's totally fair. But that's probably the most consensus I could have ever imagined that we were get, <laughs> going to get on a show like this. This is awesome. And uh, David, Absolutely. thanks for bringing those clips forward. They were, yeah, they were definitely on my list. Of, of those. I had a few others that we didn't get to, but if anybody is wondering about other sort of aerial discussions, especially interceptions, I focused on that a lot during the, the Men's World Cup. So you can go back through and I'll put some in the descriptions of past What Up Wednesdays. That's the name of my little live stream that I do uh, every Wednesday where I, I pull this out- is, this, is, this is a one- this is a What Up Wednesday on Friday. Huh? It's a What Up Friday. It's a What Up Friday. That it's yeah. already it's already been said in the, in the first in the chat. But you can go back to those okay. and you can look through our discussions and see and you can you can gauge whether I'm being consistent on these things, and look at other scenarios like there is the France Argentina play where the goalkeeper was infringing the five meters and got called for a penalty stroke inside a circle and that was a really interesting one. We talked about that on a What Up Wednesday. And the time that Roper came flying in and collided with the Welsh goalkeeper and, and injured himself, uh, but he's he's not quite a, made a glass the way the Creedy is, so he was fine. But, <laughs> you know, it, so that we have plays like that. So feel free to you know, and I encourage you to go back and look at those. The more that we look at clips together and we talk them through, that's how we really develop this kind of incredible understanding about how we're looking at the game and where we see it going. And I'm, I'm really pleased that, that we were able to do that. So, so there you go. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. looking at the chat yeah. to see if there's any other comments that are really helpful. Is this show yeah, short absolutely. because it's on a Friday cat? It's because they don't know what a Keeley hour is. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, sorry, sorry, cat. I do one hour streams. That's enough. I know that Keely can talk for hours and hours and hours, and especially with all you umpires. No, no. We, we, we go straight to the point. We talk about what we said, and that's it. One hour, that's enough. <laughs> that's because you don't have as many friends as I do. Just saying. Oh, probably. Probably. <laughs> 
probably no i think i think the 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 one hour mark is 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 a good one uh, to to keep everybody involved and engaged and not not dozing off uh as well so uh i, I would like to thank uh both bernardo and david uh, for sharing their knowledge and sharing their their insights with us uh it's it's always fun to have an umpire, a coach, and and a player on the call. And and yeah, you didn't need, you didn't need any cards, Kili. You didn't need to blow the whistle. Uh, there were no red cards. There were no green cards. No yellow cards involved. Uh, I have exceptional was, uh, management very... skills, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you passed you passed the test. You passed the test in this one. <laughs> so um, no, I, thanks guys, and and thanks very much, Keely. I, I will give you the last word since you are controlling the buttons on this show. So uh, <laughs> if you want to keep on going, I can't, can't do no, anything no, about no, no, it. No. But uh, no. I I just Bernardo, thanks for stepping in at the last minute, and David, it's just it's so great to talk to a player who's there on the pitch and actually enduring these decisions and being able to share what you think so that really helps me i'm really pleased that the way that i've been looking at it and trying to encourage umpires to understand it is not too far off and that means a lot to me because i really want to help make sure that we as a community as an umpiring community keep up with what you're doing as you know innovative coaches bernardo and you know innovative players because that's how we make this game better and that has always been mm -hmm. what my mission has been here with uh fh empires and stuff and the last thank you is to everybody in the in the chat in the comments it's been fantastic i you know i usually bring up absolutely everybody's comments and discuss them that's why my shows go <laughs> for so long but um yeah. it's just i've been trying to pull up as much as i can and i really appreciate everybody's kind of ideas and all that sort of thing. Absolutely. So I will I will just put up another couple thank yous and I'll go to the screen. <laughs> but thanks everybody and we'll see you again very soon. Don't you feel